Okay, so let's go through the problems in the A3 reflection. To the right is a histogram of the 100 bowling scores recorded by a player during one year of bowling. Which of the following is a correct statement? The distribution is uniform. The distribution is skewed to both the left and the right. Uh, the distribution is binomial. The distribution is normal. The distribution is unimodal and symmetric. So you do need to get used to describing the shapes of distributions. You will have to do this on the AP exam and all year long in my class. So uniform means that the distribution is roughly the same height throughout. And you can see, uh, let me see if I can get my little pointer out. My mouse doesn't want to come out to play. There it is. Um, you can see that if there's a peak, right, So there's a peak right here, so that's not uniform. If it was flat across, that would be uniform. So A is not the correct choice. It's roughly symmetric, so that means when you fold it in half, um, it's kind of like the mirror image of each other. So the left piece, if I were to cut it in half here, this is pretty much symmetric. This side on the left matches this side on the right. So the correct answer is not B, because that says... When it's skewed, that means the opposite of symmetric. That means it's either leaning to the left or the right, or I should say being dragged to the left or the right. Binomial, well, we haven't really covered that term yet, and that's uh, in a later unit, but it has nothing to do with the shape of a distribution. The distribution is normal. Again, we haven't taught you about the normal distribution. That's actually the most popular one we'll work with. But right now, you're like, oh, I have no idea. Uh, it is unimodal, which means one peak. So here we go. And symmetric. So we did say it was symmetric, and we did say it has one peak. So the correct answer is E. To the right is a histogram of test scores, which of the following is a true statement. The median score was 75. So the median is going to be halfway through these data points. And I went ahead and counted these up. I've got 8 here plus 5 there. There are 13 data points. So the median should be at the 7th data point, which means one of these two right here, which is clearly above 80. So the answer can't be A. Only 5 students scored above an A. So for B, if 90 and above was an A, most students received an A. That's not true. Only 5 out of 13 received an A. More students scored below 70, I count 4, than above 90. While I can't 100% tell that these are actually above 90, because these scores could actually be 90, I also can't say it's false. So, um, then we have more students scored above the median, and we're guessing the median is probably about in here somewhere, right? than below the median. Well, the point of a median is it divides, uh, whoops, I'm, well, it's fine. The point of a median is that it divides it in half. So D is not the answer, all right? Now, this distribution is skewed to the left. How do you know? It's kind of like you're, if you were tugging on the distribution and pulled a few of the data points away, which way did we pull? We pulled to the left. And what happens is that kind of pulls the mean lower. So when you hear about someone blowing the curve or dragging down the average, that's because they're the low ball unit. Now, if someone gets a really high grade, they can also pull up an average. And that would be skewed to the right is when they pull up an average. Skewed to the left is when they pull down an average. So the answer is E. Just again, to review distributions, you have, uh, your, look where your center is. If it's symmetric and unimodal and no outliers or gaps, your center tends to be in the middle, all right? If it's skewed left, uh, your center will probably be a little bit left. So, and then skewed right, there's your center. So most of these are actually medians, but the main thing, catch where the symmetry, they're symmetric, skewed left, skewed right. Skewed right with an outlier and a gap, there is the center, and this is fairly uniform, no gaps or outliers. And this one is bimodal because it has no peaks. So we're going to basically use what I just talked about here a little bit 
to describe this distribution. Now, SOX is in your textbook. So if you actually read your text, I'm pretty sure it's SOX in your textbook. Um, I got used to CUS, and that is Center Unusual Features Spread, uh, Shape and Spread, either order. It doesn't really matter. And they're not going to be looking on your AP exams like, oh, did they say CUS or did they say SOX? They're looking for just what, these are just reminders to you of what you have to describe. So, the center is somewhere between points 90 and 92. So if I counted all these data points, I would find the center. All right? And so it would be somewhere between here. Okay? There are no outliers or gaps. So as far as we can see, this is called a stem and leaf plot. And you can see that there are no gaps. Every row has data. And then if we're looking at symmetry, it helps to actually turn it um, sideways. So your high values are on the right and low values are on the left. And you can see that there's eh, it's pretty much one peak. This is not an obvious peak here. This could be kind of like this. And it's skewed right. Why is it skewed right? Because it's like we pulled some of the, if this had been a mound here, it would look symmetrical, right? But if we tugged on it, like you're tugging on a thread on a sweater or something, it would go to the right. So it's skewed right, which means that our average is probably higher than our median. The minimum is 56 and the maximum is 145. Now, I'm going to teach you more sophisticated ways to measure spread, but at this point in our lessons, we're going to just use range, but that's going to change pretty quick. Now, SOX is the other acronym for the same thing. It stands for SHAPE, OUTLIER, so you can see that's how we deal with unusual features, over here and then we also have center which I have up there and spread so it's the same thing it's just whichever acronym you like to remind you what you need to tell me in terms of a distribution also don't forget context like here I did say for blood sugar level um, you should always say what you're saying it should not be too naked when you're describing it and then here's another example of a distribution. Let's go ahead. This is a Parkinson's shirt class simulation from a previous year. And you can see the center, the median, I went ahead and calculated it, and it is at six. All right. There are no gaps or unusual features, no outliers. It's unimodal. We just have one peak. It's roughly symmetric. It doesn't have to be perfectly symmetric. And my range is from 2 to 10. Basically, you're actually going to subtract those to explain the range, which is 8. So there's a spread of 8. You can also say the minimum is 2 and the maximum is 10. But later, we're going to get into more sophisticated measures of spread. Okay. Whoops. Thought I got it. Number 4. A statistics teacher asks the 29 students in his class how many minutes they spent on the homework assignment. Distribution of the variable time on homework is, now, the difference between the longest time and the shortest time, that is actually the range, all right? So a description of what values a variable take and how often it takes, and that's actually a definition from your textbook. A, dis a distribution tells you what values a variable takes and how often it takes these values. So it's not the average distance uh, distributions. We can get averages for distributions, but we're not really um, saying one number is the distribution. The distribution is all the data put together. So the answer there is B. All right, now we have a histogram of the number of miles I logged on my treadmill each day. Which of the following is a false statement? By the way, this is true data. Uh, this should be from the summer of 2022 when I was able to get a lot of miles on that treadmill. All right, so we have a long tail on the right, so it is skewed right, okay? And oh, remember we're saying false statement, so you might be tempted to click on A, but we said false, so we don't want A. Uh, smaller peaks do not count for modality. This is unimodal, all right? Then let's look at our range. Yeah, my smallest value is zero. My largest was 14, so C looks fine. Are there unusual features? Yeah, look where that arrow is. There's a gap. That's an unusual feature. 
Uh, and then the median is the halfway point where the data is split in half. And yeah, it's roughly between three and four. So it's in here somewhere. So the correct answer for this one of a false statement. So this is true. I find it very helpful to write a TF after all these so I can remember which one is the answer. Because when it's the false one that's the answer, I can easily get confused and forget what I'm supposed to do, even though I know if they're true or false. A, a particularly common question in the study of wildlife behavior involves observing configurations between residents of a particular area and intruders. In each contest, the residents um, either win or lose the encounter, encounter assuming there are no times. Observers might record several is categorical. So remember that categorical distributions will have frequencies, but their values are not numerical. So for A, the value is in seconds, that is numerical. B, it's the number of animals, numerical again. Total number of contests won by the residents, that is numerical, all right? The number of residents per square mile, again, is numerical. Whether the residents win or lose, that is categorical. All right, to number seven. One way economists measure the health of, real, of the real estate market is by counting housing starts or the number of permits issued for construction of new homes. Below is a graph displaying housing starts in thousands in the U.S. from 2006 to 2009. What is the principal weakness of this graphical presentation of data? Well, the problem here, we're not, we really don't want to use pictograms, okay? So here, this value, it looks like it's about 1,800, right? And let's say this value right here, which is about 900, okay? If I just go by the height, by the way, which is what I should do, this is about half that. But you can see that the area of this is not half of this. So pictograms, because they scale like this, um, they actually exaggerate the difference. So they use area instead of height, which makes the difference seem bigger. So if the height is doubled, the area is, so is the width, which means the area is quadrupled. So using proportionally sized pictograms exaggerates the difference between years. All right, next one. Oops. We'll go ahead and figure that out. Um, which of the following can we conclude from this graph? Let me see if I can actually fix that right now. Excuse me. This is our last, of course it's the last one. Oh, that's right, because I moved things. I'm pretty sure the answer is B. Okay, so let's see. Uh, English was the favorite subject of 96 students. So how do we get that? First of all, math is 26%. We have 300 students. 26% of 300 is 0.26 times 300 or 78, all right? So that's not true. Uh, they think, oh, it's 26 students, but there are 300 total students. English, whoops, if you do the math there, English is 32% of 300. Oh, that does work out to 96. We'll go ahead and check out the others. If I add up history, English, and the arts, uh, these were the set favorite subjects of 51% which is actually more than half of the students. Then we can't tell if no student said Spanish. They might be in this other category. So D, we can't really guarantee. And then we have no idea of gender from this data, so we don't know if most of the English students were female. So that is it for your solutions. It did not take that long. So enjoy. Feel free to write down what you struggled with, anything that I need to go over more that was not clear 